Hello everybody, welcome back. Today I have a special treat for you. We are going to work out every single homework problem in section 5.1. Uh, that's because this is historically a pretty challenging section and I just want to give you the extra help. Uh, so a couple assumptions here. I'm going to go pretty fast through all the problems. I'm assuming you've memorized the trig identities and you've watched the videos or you've seen the lesson about how to verify identities and you understand the process. I'm not going to go over any of that. Uh, also, a little disclaimer, this isn't the only way to work these out. It might not even be the best way. It's just the way that I happen to see it. You might even have a better way if you do for any particular problem, have a better way. Go ahead and leave it in the comments below and we can all learn from it. Um, also, a warning. Whenever I, I put up a video about homework problems especially, uh, I want to make sure you understand that it is your job to work these problems out yourself first. Watching this video does not replace doing the homework. It does not excuse you from completing the homework problems. Math is not a spectator sport. You cannot learn math by watching. You must learn math by doing. Even though these problems are challenging, you will learn by struggling, you will learn through failure, and you will learn by eventually succeeding. That said, let's do some problems. Problem one, verify that sine times secant is equal to tangent. Can't cross the line. First substitution I would make is uh, secant is one over cosine x times sine x. Next, bring the fractions together. Sine x over cosine x. Next step, uh, step three, that's equal to tangent of x. And the identity is verified. Next problem, tangent times cosecant times cosine is equal to one. This looks like a really good situation to turn everything into sines and cosines. So let's substitute. Uh, that's not a substitution. Tangent is sine x over cosine x. Cosecant is 1 over sine x. Cosine x is cosine x over 1. Again, I'm just working with this side. Sine cancels with sine. Cosine cancels with cosine. And all that's left is 1. Not so bad. Number 9. Cosine squared x minus sine squared x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared x. I am going to approach this problem in two ways. Um, when you remember the Pythagorean identity, uh, remember that you could also sol solve this identity for any of the existing values. When I see on the right side that I only have sine squareds, I'm thinking about solving the Pythagorean identity for cosine squared so that I can then substitute that value back in for cosine squared. If I do that, I get 1 minus sine squared x minus sine squared x. I can't cross that line. And that's the same as 1 minus 2 squared x, which is what I was trying to verify. That's method 1. 1. Here I'm going to call this method 2. Working with the right side. Since 1 is equal to cosine squared x plus sine squared x, anytime I see a 1, guess what you can write? And then minus, well, sine squared minus 2 sine squared is going to be negative 1 sine squared x, which matches with the other side. So that's a little more inventive of a method. Usually you'll do that substitution with um, cosine squared. I think that's the most traditional way, but you know, I just want to show you you can do it in multiple ways here. Only would need to do one of these on the homework, not both. Next problem, cosecant theta minus sine theta is cotangent times cosine. Um, I like to start on the side with a minus just because it's easier to simplify an expression than it is to uh, de-simplify it or, or to complicate an expression. And usually addition or subtraction is what makes an expression more complicated. So cosecant is 1 over sine of x. Uh, we're doing thetas here in this problem. And then minus sine of theta over 1 
So I would like to maybe combine these into a single fraction. Um, to do that, I'm going to need to get a common denominator of, how about sine, sine theta? So I'll multiply both, both parts of this term by sine theta. And then I end up with 1 minus sine squared theta, because these are multiplied together, over sine of theta. Well, 1 minus sine squared could be substituted into uh, cosine squared theta. That's equal to cosine squared theta from the Pythagorean identity. Now, there's a lot of moves you could take here. Make some space. A lot of moves you could take here, so it helps to look at the other side and sort of recognize what we're looking at. Cotangent is uh, cosine over sine, and cosine is alone. So I think it would help here to split cosine squared into cosine theta over sine theta times cosine theta over 1. That's going to bring me closest to cotangent. And in fact, that's equal to cotangent theta times cosine theta. And the identity is verified. You'll notice I used my knowledge of the right-hand side to help me know what to do with the left-hand side. We've also talked about how it is okay to work with both sides and kind of meet in the middle. If you had done that in this problem, you could have written cotangent as cosine theta over sine theta times cosine theta over 1, and then maybe written that as cosine squared theta over sine theta. And if you got then both sides to that step, that would also count as verifying the identity. I personally kind of like to just stick with one side. I think that makes a problem easier to read, but it's technically correct if you're meeting in the middle, as long as you're still not breaking the line by doing any both sides operations. Okay, I'm trying to prove uh, a bunch of stuff is all combined, uh, simplifies to sine. So I think I'm definitely going to work with the left-hand side, give myself a little space here. Um, I think, oh, I see what's going on. So you could convert everything to sines and cosines, but remember, when you see tangent and cotangent, you don't need to convert to sines and cosines. Remember that tangent is the reciprocal of cotangent. So if you multiply tangent and cotangent together, you're going to get tangent theta. We'll actually show this step. You're going to get 1. So this simplifies to 1 over cosecant theta, which simplifies to sine theta, which is what I was trying to show. So that's how you do 13. If you converted the tangent to sines and cosines, they would also cancel out and simplify in the same way. Uh, it just seems like an unnecessary step. Ooh. Sine squared theta times 1 plus cotangent squared theta equals 1. So again, we're equal 1 here, so I expect something's going to simplify. I also see this 1 plus cotangent squared, so I'm going to go dig up the list of Pythagorean identities. And I see that the highlighted part in yellow is actually identical to one of the main Pythagorean identities. So I'm going to use that opportunity to substitute that in for cosecant. So I have sine squared theta times cosecant squared theta. Well, that's the same as sine squared theta, uh, how do I do it, times 1 over sine squared theta, which is just equal to 1. And the problem is solved again. All right, so looking at problem 21, we have a tangent squared, we have a secant, uh, and we, again, looks like we have some subtraction. So I feel like I want to work with the more complicated side. Um, I'm actually torn here. I do know there's a Pythagorean identity with tangent squared, but I do also feel like the more complicated side probably is this side with subtraction. So I'm just going to play around with the subtraction side here and see what happens. Secant t is 1 over cosine of t, and then this is subtracted by cosine of t over 1. Uh, like before, I could carry out the subtraction if I get a common denominator. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this problem by cosine of t. And then I'll rewrite 
the simplified version, so I have 1 over cosine of t minus cosine squared of t over cosine of t. Uh, that will equal 1 minus cosine squared of t over cosine of t. That will equal sine squared of t over cosine of t, because again, Pythagorean identity. Make a little space here. Now I'm going to go look at what I uh, was tasked with, which was tangent squared over secant. And I do actually feel like, uh, now that I've reduced this to sine and cosine, I don't really want to unreduce it. So I am going to jump to the other side and try to simplify tangent squared over secant squared and see what I can get. Um, so tangent squared, I'm going to write this as two separate fractions. And since on my right side I had everything turned into sines and cosines, I'm going to do the same thing here. So this is going to be sine t squared t over cosine squared t times, well, 1 over secant is cosine of t. Well, now it's actually pretty clear what's happening. Cosine will cancel with cosine, and this side will equal sine squared of t over a single copy cosine of t and both sides match up nicely. So that's how you approach uh, one way to approach that problem. You could probably work, continue your work with either side and maybe turn this with a Pythagorean identity into something else uh, and work it around. Perhaps there's an easier way, actually I'm almost sure there's an easier way directly using the tangent squared identity, but this way seems to work just fine for now. No, your eyes do not deceive you. We're actually going to do problem 21 again. I just couldn't seem to let it go that I felt like there would be an easier way working with tangent squared. So I know that 1 plus tangent squared of t is going to equal secant squared of t. So tangent squared of t is going to equal secant squared of t minus 1. And again, this is just work you can do on the side. So then on the left side of this identity, I could replace the numerator with secant squared of t minus 1 over secant of t. When you split up a fraction, we could do uh, secant squared of t over secant of t minus 1 over secant of t. And this is definitely the way that you're supposed to do this problem. The far most efficient way, secant squared over secant is just going to give you secant of t, and 1 over secant of t is equal to cosine of t, and the problem is complete. So again, um, yes, you can always convert things to sines and cosines. I know that's one of the strategies your book uh, recommends, uh, and it's often a strategy students leap for when they don't know what else to do. Works, but oh my gosh, whenever you see that tangent squared, um, or a, you know any of the, the weird trig functions squared, try to look for those alternative Pythagorean identities. The work we put into proving those then makes every other problem easier. That's kind of the point of those identities. So please look out for them when you can use them. All right, problem 25. I think we're about halfway done here. So I'm trying to confirm that something is equal to 1. Um, I could replace that 1 with something from an identity, but I think I'm just going to leave it. And we'll just work with this side. Um, sine over cosecant, let's see, so I want to write this as sine t uh, time, so cosecant is 1 over sine, so this is really sine t times sine of t. Now I think I see what's going on. Cosine of t over secant of t, well cosine of t is cosine. And then secant of t is really the reciprocal of cosine, so that's also really just multiplying by cosine. Well, that's sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t, which we all know is equal to 1. Problem solved. Uh, another way I was thinking about approaching this problem was maybe with a common denominator of like something like cosecant times secant. Um, 
I suspect that that would work out as well. You just get a lot of things to cancel by uh, adding factors to make a denominator. You're making the problem more complicated. So it can be nice to see if each fraction will simplify first before you do that. Uh, speaking of something that looks pretty complicated, uh, here we have problem 29. So again, we have cosine on the left. That feels pretty simple, so let's leave it there for now. Um, hmm. Now I could try to go for a common denominator with this 1. I also see this 1 plus cosine squared on the bottom, and I remember from our notes that there was a trick with the um, conjugates. I could multiply this by something uh, and see what I would get. I'm going to try something even sneakier. I see that sine squared is the only thing around right now. Like that's right, that's the only thing that's not a cosine or a 1. So I'm going to try a little substitution. We have the 1 from the front, and then I'm going to replace sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared x over 1 plus cosine x. And then because I see this 1 plus cosine x down here, I want to remember that if I have uh, a squared minus b squared, that can turn into the factor a plus b times a minus b. And the a squared and b squared that I see are 1 and cosine squared. So I'm going to factor out the numerator. It's going to get real messy. a squared minus b squared is a plus b, so 1 plus cosine x times 1 minus cosine x over 1 plus cosine x. And you're not allowed to cancel 1s in like this situation uh, right here because they're, they're part of a term. What you are allowed to do, I'll put that back, is cancel entire terms when you factor them out. So when I have a 1 plus cosine x over that entire grouping, those can cancel out. And again, it's what I noticed there was not actually anything to do with trig. It was actually just a factoring pattern uh, that I recognized. So recognizing a factoring pattern actually helped me solve this problem. So now I'm going to have 1 minus, well, the only thing that's left is uh, the term 1 minus 1 minus cosine x. The 1s will cancel, and the minus and minus make this equal to cosine x, which is what we were looking for. So uh, that's how I would approach 29. That looks pretty tricky. I'm sure there's a lot of other approaches, but that seems like a pretty good one using uh, identity and then factoring. All right, 33. Secant squared times cosecant squared is equal to something with addition. Uh, secant squared plus cosecant squared. Whenever I see secant squareds or cosecant squareds, I immediately think about Pythagorean identities. Let's see here. Um, I paused for a second to think about this problem, uh, and I'm not sure Pythagorean identities are the way I want to go immediately. If I substitute in for the secant or cosecant, I'll end up with a tangent or cotangent, and I don't see tangents or cotangents on the other side, no matter which side I start with, so that makes it feel like um, something might not work out. Instead, I'm going to go with the philosophy I've been going with, where I start with the more complicated side and work towards the simplest side, and that plus sign on the right is what makes that side particularly complicated. I also noted on the left that secant squared times cosecant squared is the same as 1 over cosine squared times sine squared. So if I can get the right side to match either of these two, then I know I'll be done. So secant squared is 1 over cosine squared, and this is times uh, 1 give myself some space there. There's 1 over sine squared. I think uh, the reason that this is the more complicated side is that there's always something you can do when you have fractions, and it's create a common denominator. So my common denominator is going to need to be cosine squared times sine squared, because I have those are the terms in my fractions, and I actually like that now that I see it, because that's what I had on the other side. So let's multiply this term by sine squared over sine squared, and let's multiply this term by cosine squared x over cosine squared x. So then I will get 
sine squared x plus cosine squared x, that's the numerators, all over cosine squared x times sine squared x. That's just that multiplication pattern. Oh wait, this is equal to 1. So really this is simplified into 1 over cosine squared x sine squared x. And since I already did my work on the right hand side, uh, or left hand side, to show that those are equivalent, I now have a match and this problem is also complete. Alright, here's problem 37. Alright, so with 37, there is uh, a factoring pattern that you're going to start to recognize and if you don't see it right away, that's okay. Um, but remember that difference of squares. So we know sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. There's no identity substitution for sine squared minus cosine squared. But a big clue is everything else hiding out in the problem. Sine x plus and sine x minus, uh, sine x plus cosine and sine x minus cosine. That's telling you that you should factor as a difference of squares. So if you have sine squared x minus cosine squared x, you can always factor that just like a difference of squares, a squared minus b squared. Every single time that's allowed, you're able to do that. Now, does it help in every problem? No, often it, it's not a helpful move, but I see in this problem that there's a lot of other terms that will cancel if you do that. So a little bit of thinking ahead is really going to pay off here. Now, I'm feeling lazy, so I'm just going to take that term, uh, paste that in as a substitution, and write that over right here. Now we know uh, that an entire term like this can cancel. And so then within one step, it's just this problem is really asking you to recognize that factoring step. This is equal to sine x minus cosine x, which is what we were trying to show. So that's how you solve problem 37, recognizing factoring patterns. Without that, I think you would be uh, having a very hard time, I would say. I don't think there's a, an efficient way to do this problem without recognizing that factoring pattern. All right, problem 43. So uh, this is a problem that students always ask me about every year, and I totally understand why. Uh, this is actually a problem that's asking, that's proving an identity you're going to learn later. So when we teach you this identity, uh, I will go back and say, hey, did you do problem 43 on the homework? then you've already proven this identity. Um, but we threw it on here because we know that you can do it already. What complicates life in this problem 43 is that we have x's and we also have y's. And those are going to be separate. So like, for example, if I in a problem had sine squared x plus cosine squared y, that's not equal to 1. That's just equal to nothing. We don't know anything about the relationship between x and y. So the identities that you're wanting to use are probably not going to work in this situation. Um, so we're going to have to be a little bit more strategic about things. Uh, before we solve this problem, we're going to have a brief kitty cat interlude. I know you guys would want to see her. Uh, she's feeling very friendly. So this is Pepper. She's a good cat. She's a lonely cat. And she is leaving now. And despite the fact that people ask about this question every year, I have forgotten how to do this problem. So you might see me make some mistakes here. I'm not sure. Um, what I see, though, is that uh, on the right side, I have all these sines and cosines. And I feel like those are going to be harder to simplify than the side with tangents. So what I think I'm going to do is write the uh, other side in terms of tangents, or in terms of sines and cosines. Okay, so I've written everything in terms of sine and cosine, and I now actually do see a path uh, forward here. So the path I see is that I have one large fraction bar that I'm going to preserve. My suspicion is that this large fraction bar is the same as this large fraction bar on the other side. And within each fraction, 
I recognize that I have an addition or a subtraction problem. So I'm going to kind of treat those addition and subtraction problems separately from each other, leaving that large fraction bar in the middle, and then we'll simplify and rewrite. So I'm actually just going to write the fraction bar, and then we'll do the numerator first, and then the denominator. Within the numerator, um, we need a common denominator, and the common denominator is going to have to be cosine x times cosine y. So I need to take this first term and multiply it by cosine y. And I need to take the second term and multiply it by cosine x. So then what will I get? Uh, I will get, so I'm going to kind of take this numerator and write it in blue. I will get cosine y sine x plus sine y cosine x all over cosine y cosine x. That's just the numerator. And now I'm going to take the denominator, and we'll, I don't know, we'll do the denominator in orange, we'll get some bears colors going or something. Um, and I see that I need to replace this one, or not replace, but I need to turn this one into something useful with the common denominator, and the common denominator is going to have to be, again, cosine x cosine y. So since this is a one, uh, I have to just multiply by cos x cos y to the top and bottom. Um, and then I'm now allowed to add these fractions. So I'll add the, the numerator of the denominator, and I should get cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y, and that will be all over cosine x cosine y. Very interesting. Okay, so this original fraction, I've done a lot of sort of sub-fraction math, and I'm kind of abusing my ability to zoom in and out of the problem here, but maybe you're writing either really small or uh, really big. This problem just takes some space. Guess what? We're done. You see it? Let me write this as a fraction. I am going to abuse notation. I should probably work down, but because I want to keep everything on the same page, I'm going to work to the side. So when you multiply fractions, I don't think I can abuse the second one, you flip and multiply. Uh, and so when you flip and multiply this critter out, you notice that the bottom term is going to have some stuff that cancels with the top term. Cosine y cosine x, cosine y cosine x goes away. And then this whole thing will equal cosine y sine x plus sine y cosine x all over cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. And guess what? That is equal to that. The order's different a little bit, right? Sine, the sine and cosines are in a different order, but that's okay. Uh, it is important to double check your x's and y's. So like I have a sine x, sine x, uh, cosine x is in the second term. Kind of double check that it's the same, but if it's in a different order, uh, you know, it's going to be okay. But that's how I would approach this problem. It looks really intimidating until you just break it down uh, into sines and cosines and remember your fraction math and don't be afraid. Also, just keep track of all your terms. You know, one little error in this step could cause you, will cause the whole thing to not, not function out because you have this nice cancellation when you do everything right. So that's something to watch out for. This is the problem I think that uh, students always have the hardest time with on the homework. So uh, now you have a method for approaching it.